Good morning, everyone. So my work really sits at the uh, crossroads between uh, path planning and, uh, and control. And so often we have a path that we'd like our robot to follow. So as you can see in the plot on the left here, uh, we have uh, the joint positions of the robot. Uh, they're uh, parameterized uh, as smooth functions of S, uh, some scalar value. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to turn that into a trajectory that the controller of a robot can follow. <clears throat> and so as I said, uh, a path is time independent, and we'd like to generate a trajectory, which is a function of time. Uh, this trajectory also must be uh, subject to the dynamic constraints of the robot. Uh, so for example, the equation of motion, which you'll hear me refer to as the torque constraints of the robot, uh, and also the equation which we use to propagate the system. Uh, but there may also be additional constraints, such as joint velocity, uh, or we may have safety constraints like momentum, where we'd like to uh, uh, that we'd like to keep it within. Uh, additionally, we have some sort of uh, cost function we like to optimize over. Uh, for this work, we'll be focusing on time optimality. Um, so, uh, you know, oftentimes we have a path because we have some sort of uh, complex geometric constraints. Uh, there's these many, many path-centric applications like painting, welding, uh, milling, uh, opening and closing doors, uh, turning valve cranks. In these instances, to keep the problem tractable, we often uh, perform geometric path planning first uh, with respect to these kinematic constraints. Uh, and then we uh, uh, afterwards generate a trajectory with respect to the dynamics. Uh, so additionally, we may also want to compute, uh, so uh, initial, initially we have some sort of state of the system, uh, some initial velocity, uh, and we, uh, when we're generating a trajectory, we'd also have some sort of desired final velocity for the system at the end of the path. Uh, however, we may also want to compute the admissible velocity intervals. I say admissible because these uh, intervals have to respect the dynamics, just the same as the rest of the trajectory. Uh, and so in this case, it's a, it's a bit of a different problem. We'd like to uh, compute uh, over some minimum and maximum initial range at the start of the trajectory. We'd like to compute uh, globally uh, the entire range of velocities that we could achieve at the end of the trajectory. Um, and so why would we want to do that? Uh, admissible velocity propagation, uh, it's an interesting method. Uh, it enables motion planners to plan in the geometric space uh, while honoring uh, kinodynamic constraints. Uh, and so the kinodynamic space can essentially be searched uh, much faster via uh, these admissible velocity intervals since rather than generating uh, single points in the uh, dynamic space, we're actually computing the entire velocity interval which gives us essentially a volume uh, as opposed to a single value. And we can do this uh, very cheaply. Uh, so there's some prior methods for uh, path parameterization. Uh, the two that uh, two we'll look at here is uh, phase plane navigation. Uh, you may have referred, uh, heard this referred to as the integration method or even back in the day as Bow Browse algorithm. Uh, I, phase plane navigation is a little more descriptive for what we're actually doing, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, convex optimization is the other approach. And so both of these uh, methods have trade-offs. Uh, so in the case of phase plane navigation, uh, the a, uh, one benefit is that those admissible velocity intervals that I just discussed, uh, they can be computed with the same time complexity as the trajectory generation problem. So you essentially get them for free. Uh, and it's also been shown to be faster in the convex optimization approach. However, uh, in these previous methods, uh, they're constricted to time optimality for the cost function. Uh, and they only were, uh, and they also to uh, uh, only torque and uh, joint velocity constraints. Uh, additionally, there are some heuristics that are used which, uh, which actually uh, uh, nullified completeness in these prior algorithms. Uh, in the convex optimization approach, we can uh, very easily change out the cost function, um, but currently there's no extension to the ADI computation problem. Uh, it's a bit slower, and uh, we have to be concerned about the convexity of our constraints since uh, uh, if, if our constraints form uh, non-convexities, then the method may not work. And so the user of this method would generally need to have some experience in convex optimization. Uh, so our contributions, uh, we generate, we uh, uh, present two uh, algorithms, one for trajectory generation and one for AVI computation. Uh, both of these algorithms generalize to a broad class of constraints beyond torque and velocity. Uh, and uh, as an example, we introduce momentum and workspace uh, velocity limits uh, and also uh, kind of ignored in the prior work were minimum phase velocity constraints. We also add those. Uh, and finally, uh, we're uh, resolution complete. Uh, we do this by eliminating those heuristics in the prior methods through an efficient uh, graph search method. So uh, first off, what is what exactly is this phase plane I'm, I'm referring to? In this case, it's a plane defined where the x-axis is the path position, uh, the y-axis is the path velocity, and we have some starting and ending velocities at either in the path, in this case I've set it to zero, and we'd like to find a path through this space from start to end. If we do that, then we have a trajectory. <coughs> so if we apply uh, bang bang control or maximal control, we have a curve like this. Unfortunately, it didn't, didn't reach the end state, but if we repeat the same process from the end state, uh, we can find an intersection between these two, uh, and now we have a, a trajectory. Uh, Bobrow also proved that uh, if you maximize s dot or the path velocity, you minimize time, and that the uh, set of profiles that form a uh, 
that form the largest area under the curve of all possible within the, the plane uh, gives you the time optimal solution, uh, which is what we have here. Uh, unfortunately, in reality, we can rarely do that so simply because the dynamic constraints uh, induce these inadmissible regions within our plane. Uh, essentially, uh, one can think that if the, uh, for example, from our equation of motion, uh, the velocity at, at these points above the curve would result in us needing to uh, supply more torque than the system is capable of. And so we clearly can't pass through these, these regions. Um, and so we're stuck. How do we get around this? We need to find uh, some control switches that allow us to, uh, to get around the inadmissible region. And so in the prior methods, they reason over uh, the specific constraint functions. So for example, the equation of motion uh, or uh, the joint velocities define these. Uh, and once we found it, we can expand as we did and find uh, a new trajectory. Unfortunately, in this prior, these prior methods, uh, there's this question of, there may be many, many, many of these uh, possible control switching states, but we really need the correct one. And so in their method, they uh, expend a lot of energy trying to, uh, to determine that. Uh, it, uh, at the cost of completeness as well, uh, since it's heuristically decided. Uh, in our method, uh, if we have some mashup of constraint functions, uh, we need to only consider the uh, bottom envelope, so it's a piecewise uh, wise curve. Uh, and likewise, we can do the same for the minimum velocity curve. Uh, and we also provide an algorithm for finding all possible constraint switching states uh, in this general case uh, over, uh, over any set of constraint curves. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, the prior algorithms, uh, they have these heuristics, and we, we avoid this rule-based selection by exhaustively expanding all of the switch points uh, in the entire system. Uh, so this kind of leaves us with a bit of a mess of profiles. Uh, and uh, so, unfortunately, what, what is the correct set of profiles to get us through the, through the space? Uh, and so we use this continuity graph that uh, I show here, uh, where we encode uh, profiles as nodes and intersections as edges. Uh, and so then our algorithms can rely on this continuity graph to extract solution trajectories and compute the admissible velocity intervals. Uh, so as we can see here, uh, by searching through the graph from one, four, to five, to six, uh, we can find a path that corresponds to the correct profiles to get us through the plane. Okay, so to test our algorithms, uh, we generated a thousand paths. Uh, each was generated by sampling four waypoints randomly from the robot's configuration space. Uh, C2 uh, paths were created uh, using uh, quintic polynomial interpolation, and these paths were discretized very finely to a thousand. Uh, all the paths also have quasi-static solutions. Uh, it's important that these uh, paths have quasi-static solutions because this way we can, uh, uh, in the case where the algorithm returns that no solution exists, we know this is in fact a failure of the algorithm since the quasi-static solution exists for all possible, uh, for all of the cases. Uh, additionally, in this success rate term besides that, we also, uh, in the case where a trajectory is returned that in fact violates the constraints, that's also counted against the success rate. And so uh, with TOP, the library we compare with, uh, you can see that there's pretty high variation depending on what arm is being used, uh, whether or not we're dealing with uh, uh, trajectories or trying to compute admissible velocity intervals, and, what the, con and the constraints. Uh, whereas with our algorithm, it's, uh, we re receive 100% success across the board. Uh, similarly, as I conjectured earlier, that the admissible velocity intervals should uh, see a similar time complexity to trajectory generation. Uh, we see this is in fact the case for our algorithm, and it's even across the board, uh, whereas there's high variance within the top library. Uh, so in conclusion, I presented two uh, phase plane navigation algorithms, uh, for one for trajectory generation, the other for AVI computation. Uh, we can handle a large diversity of constraints, uh, well beyond previous methods, uh, and both are fast and more robust, uh, faster and more robust than the current state of the art. Uh, so, so future work, uh, so all of the constraint curves that I described previously uh, form these upper and lower bounds, uh, but there are constraints that form these inadmissible islands within the uh, phase plane. For example, when torque is a function of uh, velocity, uh, we generate these bubbles essentially, and so uh, there needs to be an extension to the algorithm to handle this. Uh, we believe we can do that with the continuity graph. Uh, additionally, uh, cost functions other than time, as I said, this is uh, stuck uh, to time, we'd obviously like to be able to evaluate things like energy or work. So finally, for my uh, dirty laundry, uh, so as I mentioned, it's a resolution complete algorithm. The only toggle that users really have is, uh, is epsilon, some uh, discrete step size for path discretization and also for the integration step size. Although, as you saw, even for a very long path that's been very finely discretized, uh, we still have uh, very good time. Thank you. Okay, okay, Jarvis Schultz is our first responder. Yeah. All right, so uh, well, my first question is, um, how do you think this might extend to a system that's maybe under-actuated or where the paths you're trying to follow are not even feasible? 
or like where you're, like in your example where they all all of your states were quasi statically reachable right. what if that's not true right yeah and so one of the uh, nice things about this algorithm is that uh, you know we can actually we can actually prove that the path is infeasible if that's the case so uh, that's one of the reasons that was one of the testing scenarios to you know for comparison but ultimately, that's actually one of the nice things about the algorithm is that, you know, given a fine enough uh, epsilon discretization, that if the path itself isn't feasible, we can we can actually tell you that, uh, you know, affirmatively. So. Um, maybe this is a dumb question, but uh, uh, how do you fight uh, like the monotonic increase variable, the S? Because I mean, if you generate a trajectory over time, time is monotonic increase. How do you define the S? How do you find the S dot or the S? S and S dot. Okay, so the S is, is, is given. That's, that's actually your path, right? So we have these, par these smooth parametric functions that, you know, these are the curves, these are the paths. Uh, S dot then uh, is the, the entire path velocity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's given, I, I don't have the, actually, we can, we can look at backup slides. Uh, so uh, from the chain rule, we can derive what the, uh, what the uh, velocity of every joint in the system is from that s dot value. It's uh, simply the uh, first derivative of our path uh, times that s dot value. And so, uh, by, you know, inverting that, you can find s dot from q dot as well. Okay, we have time for one more question while our next speaker sets up. Uh, are you worried about the manipulator following right along this path of the admissible region? Is there any like, kind of like safety concerns there? So actually, uh, quite the opposite. In fact, you, uh, in this case, we generally want to be following exactly as close to the constraints as possible, which is why we look for those switching states, um, which, uh, which is exactly why we're looking for those switching states, because uh, for maximizing time or whatever our cost function is, we want to, in, uh, in, the opti in the sense of optimization, we want to stay as close to our constraints as possible which means that we're saturating, you know, whatever that value is to minimize the function. 